Okay, class. So I am going to be looking uh, today at chapters 21 and 22. Um, 21 is on utility utility uh, theory and behavioral economics. I'm not going to have much to say about behavioral economics per se. There's a lot on the internet that you can read on and I don't really uh, quiz you or give you any kind of test questions on it, but it is interesting. Um, there are, um, there are, uh, there's a growing body of behavioral economics that looks at uh, the way human beings actually makes, uh, make choices and uh, they try to compare to see how does that fit with economic theory. And in some instances, the way that human beings behave uh, seems to contradict um, uh, economic theory. Um, if, if you're interested in this, uh, there's a couple of books I can suggest. Let me just very quickly, let's see, um, let's see if I can get a browser here. Just very quickly suggest a couple of things to you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's see here. Um, Predictably uh, Irrational is a good book that looks at uh, some of the theories of behavioral economics and how they relate to standard economic uh, theory. Uh, it's a really good book if you're interested in uh, diving deep into this kind of thing. So is uh, so is the book by uh, Daniel uh, Kahneman. This is a slightly larger book, but he is sort of the, the the godfather of this sort of research. He's got a lot of information on behavioral economics. And then if you want to look at something from the other side, um, I believe the name of the book is... Uh, let's see, let me go back. Uh, let's see if I can find it just by looking at something here. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, it's one of those books that's at the tip of my tongue, and I do not recall it. Let's see. Ah, here we go. So, uh, Richard uh, McKinsey, you can see this one is uh, predictably irrational. This one is predictably rational and this would be a defense of the traditional uh, economic uh, position and this one is arguing against uh, the position that uh, you'll find in predictably irrational so if you're interested and you want to delve more into it as you can see in the screen you can take a look at take a look at both of those books okay so I like I said I won't say much about behavioral economics. Uh, I will get into utility uh, theory and uh, why it's important. And this is sort of what you'll get tested on when you take the quiz, the exam. First, let me begin by saying that you know utility uh, theory is is an abstract uh, construct about uh, how human beings uh, make. A, a selection of things given a limited number of, of options. And the notion of a util, as you see here, util, U-T-I-L, again, this isn't something that exists in the real world. It is, it is an abstraction that economists use to try to describe something that really isn't... Uh, mm, 
it's not a, it's not so much a psychological term, a term of psychology. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I suppose there might be some sort of ingenious way to try to measure this, but it, it's a way of trying to describe uh, the satisfaction that a person receives from consuming one good or, or, or service uh, as opposed to some other good or service. So, you know, you, you may get a certain level of satisfaction consuming pizza. Uh, I may get a certain level of satisfaction of, of consuming uh, fine wine. Uh, there's no way to say that your level of satisfaction is any greater than mine or mine any greater than yours. All that economic theory is suggesting here at the moment is that um, based on the way you select your items, something can be said about the level of satisfaction that you get from the selection of those items, okay? Uh, it's not something that you can measure in hard, cold numbers. It isn't anything like that, but it's something that's sort of, uh, it's sort of understood, it's understood uh, abstractly and purely just by rational argumentation, okay? So to understand utility uh, theory, you have to understand something about marginal or diminishing marginal utility. And by now, I, the book, uh, you should know something about this re if you've read some of the previous chapters. Uh, I know I didn't begin these lectures uh, at the very beginning, uh, but I know that if you've read any of the material, you must have uh, crossed this concept already. And this is the idea that when you're consuming any good, uh, each excessive item that you consume becomes less and less satisfying. So let's say, you know, you eat your first slice of pizza, you get a, a large amount of satisfaction out of it. So you, your utility, uh, the utils, if you will, that you, that you uh, get from eating that one uh, first slice of pizza are, is, is, uh, is great. When you eat the second slice of pizza, the number of utils goes down. Again, we don't, can't really quantify, but all we can simply say is that the, um, the satisfaction that you get out of that second slice is a lot less than the first slice. When you eat the third slice, again, that satisfaction decreases. So you can see that marginally speaking, meaning each additional unit, that's what marginal means, uh, you, uh, you lose utility with the consumption of each additional slice of pizza. And this is what the chart is showing you here. Notice that the utility uh, utils uh, are going down. The greater number, this is apples in this chart, in this uh, PowerPoint, the, the uh, greater the number of apples, the, um, the less each marginal util. Uh, but notice total utility, total utility, right, is the maximum utility of the, the slice itself. So there is a difference between total utility and marginal utility, right? Um, and we'll look more at that as we as we look as we continue on through uh, looking at these PowerPoints. All right. So, so you notice both total utility and marginal utility are expressed in utils. Like I said, a util is a, it's just an abstract kind of thing. It's like when we say widgets and we're talking about production. Marginal utility is the change in total utility divided by the change in the quantity consumed of the good. So you have total utility, which is uh, tier number two, uh, uh, divided by, uh, so yeah, total utility divided by the change in quantity. And if you notice the change in quantity is always one, we're, we're, we're doing one, the change from one to two is one, the change from two to three, that's also one, the change from three to four, that is also one, and the change from four to five, that is also one. Notice that uh, total utility, right, uh, continues to increase, but marginal utility, that is the satisfaction that you get out of each individual slice that you consume, that decreases. So understand that the relationship between the two, total utility may be increasing, marginal utility you know will always um, decrease with most things, okay? Way of graphing it, if you can see in the graph here, make it a little bigger, you can see that this is the total utility curve. 
You can see here on the left hand side is total, util total utility, uh, quantity of goods here. This could be pizza, apples, whatever it might be. Notice they get bigger and you can see that the total utility increases but the marginal utility decreases. Again, this is just a graphical representation of what we have up here on the chart. Okay. So, the law of marginal, diminishing marginal utility, right? It's based on the notion that, you know, you have alternate uses for the things that you consume. And so, what, and if you are, say, using, for example, say, let's say you're on an island, for example, you only have a certain amount of daylight available to you. Let's say you, you've been stranded, right? Well, your first immediate uh, need that you have to satisfy is food and water. So you are going to allocate the number of, of uh, daylight hours that you have instantly and immediately to uh, seeking food, water, and shelter, right? So that's how you're going to allocate. So those are the most urgent things you need to find. So you're going to allocate more hours to that to that activity. As those things are uh, accomplished, right? You then are able to uh, let's say the next day or the day after that, you then are able to allocate more hours, say perhaps to uh, exploring the island, right? Um, uh, maybe perhaps uh, you can devote some time to, to creating traps to catch animals, maybe creating uh, fishing materials to catch fish. The point is that you are going to, um, you are going to allocate the, the units of either of the goods that you use or the available resources that you have uh, to satisfy the most urgent uh, needs first and then as you satisfy those uh, urgents, whatever is remaining, then you'll use it to satisfy the least urgent uh, things that you have to satisfy, whether it be, you know, uh, maybe exploring the island or, or so on. Right? Again, it's the issue of what do you do with that additional uh, unit of something that you have available. The book wants to make sure, the author wants to make, sh wants to make sure that you uh, remember that utility is something that's subjective in nature. And there really is no way of saying something about the utility of one person versus the utility of another person. Only that person knows how much something is or is not satisfying. And you can't really sort of make comparisons between two people, even if they happen to be twins, like, like this picture. Okay, so let's move on. So the chapter proposes a, a problem involving uh, diamonds and water. And, and this is a... It's a problem that goes back to oh the 19th century, where um, uh, economists were trying to answer this issue as to why uh, water, which is a, a life-saving element, is not as expensive as diamonds, which you know you don't you don't need to survive. And so, marginal utility was a concept that was devised, or at least it was utilized to try to solve the problem and it seems uh, it seems to do just that so before I get into the the notation here let me let me go through that paradox okay so yeah imagine if you will um, um, you have one glass of water you're very thirsty let's say maybe you've just hiked a mile or so in the hot Sun that first cup of water is uh, urgent so you're going to get a maximum amount of utility from it in fact let's assume that you're crossing the desert and if you don't get water soon you're about to die but you do you're carrying with you in your backpack a bunch of diamonds if you come across someone that happens to have water and the person uh, that has the water tells you well you, I'll give you a cup of water but you'll have to give me all of the diamonds you have in your backpack um, you will give that person your diamonds because after all right now we're talking about the difference between your life and the value of the diamonds in that kind of scenario you understand how the water becomes much more valuable than diamonds but you know let's say you're not in that situation you're simply thirsty you have your first glass of water right um, if, if you go into a shop and you ask someone 
for uh, a glass of water and they demand that you give them diamonds, you will probably walk out of the store and do what? Go to some other place. Uh, maybe go back home and get water out of your faucet, right? So the fact that um, two things are happening here. Number one is uh, the supply of water and the easy accessibility of water, right, impacts your decision. But also, once you've had that first cup of water, let's say that you know that uh, you, you've crossed, you've done, you, you've been out hiking and you have the first glass of water, you get a, a high level of, of satisfaction out of it. You drink the second one, still a high level of satisfaction, but a little less than the first. By the time you get to your third or maybe fourth cup of water, right, the marginal utility, that is the satisfaction that you're getting out of that last cup of water, might be zero. You're full. There's not much more that can be gained. Hence, you reach zero sort of marginal utility. Now, notice if, if it were the case, right, that you were being told that that is the only amount of water that you can have, say, for a very long time, right, then in other words, that those three glasses of water is all you're going to get, say, for the next uh, 48 hours or something like that, or 72 hours. Then not only are you going to consume them much less, but each, right, each, the, the satisfaction that you get from each drink that you take from that water uh, is not decreasing because you know that this is the, this is the total amount of water that you will have for a while. But that's not the way it is with water usually. Water is plentiful. So you know you don't have to worry about that. So, so since water is more plentiful and since consuming water results in diminishing marginal returns or diminishing marginal utility, right? Compare that with diamonds. You get one diamond. If you get a second diamond, do you, do you think you experience any loss of marginal utility from that second diamond? No. In fact, your wealth has increased, hasn't it? If you get a third diamond, has, your, has the marginal utility for that diamond decrease? Nope. Uh, in fact, your wealth has gone up. One can almost say that your mar the marginal utility has increased, if not stayed the same, right? And it, again, it's because of the scarcity of the diamond, right? And the fact that you can't find any ready substitutes for it, and you can't go and sort of find your own, they're not, they're not casually laying all over the ground, you know, readily available for you to pick up. So that's the idea. It's that marginal utility tends to explain the cost differences or why we value one thing over another. All right, so let's keep going. So let's look at this notation. So what economic theory has done is kind of put it in notation form to, uh, to help to understand it perhaps a little better. If we were in an advanced econ class, we'd be doing a lot of math with this. We're not going to do that here. But to explain to you what this means, you have the marginal utility of product A and, the, and the, uh, the price, the dollar spent here, of that item. And then uh, you have product B, product C, all the way on right to infinity. And then product, uh, uh, so this is marginal utility up here. Product A, product B, product C, and all the way up to, you know, product Z, those are you know, all the products that say that are available to you that, uh, that, that you can have. And notice that you can divide the uh, marginal um, the utility by the price. Okay? So why is this important? Uh, only insofar as you should know this for the quiz, right? The equilibrium position, uh, as far as the notation goes, is where marginal utility of A over the, the price of A equals the marginal utility of B over the price of B. So if you have two products, A and B, and uh, they're both, um, and, and, and you are equally, uh, uh, in other words, you get, the, you get the same amount of utility from A as you do from B, right? There's no difference. So you're indifferent to A or B, then that is the equilibrium position. If for some reason something happens for you to have greater uh, have a greater utility or experience um, uh, greater satisfaction over one say uh, product A than B, let's say perhaps product A loses value, then you would choose that product. Uh, on the other hand, if it's B that say goes down in price, 
then you would choose that product. So this is essentially all that you really need to get uh, out of this uh, chapter as far as the, the quiz is concerned. Right. Again, behavioral economics, I'm not going to have much to say. Um, you can read about it in the textbook. Again, I'll leave that uh, up to your own uh, study. All right. So that was chapter 21. I want to now really quickly go into chapter 22. Um, I don't want you guys to be um, terrified by this material. I don't. Um, this isn't something where I am going to uh, uh, ask you tons and tons of questions about these. Uh, curves and how to calculate costs or anything like that. In fact, right now, as I'm looking at my other computer here, I'm going to take a quick look at the uh, at the quiz. Let me go ahead and take a look at that and just see what we're looking at in terms of the questions on this. Let's see. Yeah. The study guides are all up there now, by the way, so you can uh, get ahead on, on studying. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so as you saw from the study guide, there are uh, a couple of a couple of graphs that uh, you'll have to know about. Uh, and essentially, all I'm asking you to do on these is to just identify what the graphs are, which is the marginal uh, cost curve, the average total cost, the average fixed cost. So that, that's really all I want in terms of, you know, you you knowing this material um, and uh, also to understand something about the um, economies of scale and the long run uh, average total cost curve, which we'll look at. So we'll, we'll take a quick look at, um, at, uh, at this uh, and give you some, you know, some insight. Um, there's a good question that begins this chapter, and that is, you know, when you think about um, the theory of, say, you know, economics when it comes to um, agents out in the market, you know, uh, firms, um, the theory says that they will uh, tend to compete to maximize uh, profit, and they will try to do that at the least, at the lowest possible cost that, that can be had in any given market, right? So uh, a problem uh, arose uh, back in the 20s and 30s, an economic problem, uh, inquiring as to why is it that, you know, businesses sort of form themselves the way they do, so that they have an accounting department, a marketing department, a production department, or finance, and so on. Why not? Why is it that businesses don't sort of farm out those functions so that you have like a central core uh, which say owns the business and then all the various functions are being um, uh, done by other entities right so that there's no such thing as a corporation as we understand it with the various different departments all of its various functions are being served by a different entity right um, the way you and I for example if we need accounting service we'll go out and hire an accountant if we need if we need uh, a lawyer will go out and hire a lawyer. We don't have, you know, on staff people normally uh, don't have that uh, in-house. Uh, individuals usually uh, have that in-house. You go out and you hire those things. Well, why is it that firms don't do the same? And uh, Ronald, uh, by the way, your book had it had his name wrong. It isn't Coase. His last name is Coase. Ronald Coase. And his his uh, our, his suggestion for his um, his ra reasoning here was simply that. Uh, um, uh, economic theory uh, up to his time and when he wrote about this was ignoring transactions costs. That is that every transaction, no matter what it might be, has a certain level of cost associated to it. And so the transactions costs associated with having one firm and having the various departments within it, within the firm itself, those transaction uh, costs are a lot less than the firm trying to sort of farm out those functions out in the marketplace. And again, if you're interested in, in reading uh, uh, more about this, uh, you can just say, look up, excuse me, Ronald. Let me show you the book that you might want to read. And that is this one. The uh, 
the firm, the market, and the law. It's not filled with a lot with mathematics at all. He he writes in a very clear and uh, engaging way. And if you want to know more about this theory, th that would be the book to look at. All right, so that's Coase. So let's let's get into uh, the um, the issue of costs and what they mean. We begin our analysis by understanding that from an economic point of view, the objective of a firm is to maximize profit. So profit is total revenue. That is all of the revenue that the firm makes at any given moment minus total cost, right? Um, cost uh, can be broken down into various categories. The three major categories, and we'll be looking at explicit costs in a moment in a more detailed way. But explicit costs are the ones that um, usually you find in a balance sheet, an income statement, say, a uh, cash flow statement. These are the, the costs that, that can be written down on paper. Implicit costs, I like to think of these as opportunity costs, meaning they're not costs that you're ever going to sort of see in any kind of balance sheet or income statement. But think about it. Um, you know, when, when you decide that you want to, say, open a business, uh, all the money that you invested into that business could have been used for some other investment. So at the end of the year, if you were to compare the amount of revenue that you made in the business you decided to go into, and compare that to the amount of money that you might have made in some other investment, right? If it were the case at the end of one year that you would have made a lot more money in that second investment, well, that's a cost. It's not anything that you've, you, um, you can put down on a balance sheet, right? But it is a cost in the sense that that's the cost that's foregone, or at least, at least I should say that's the benefit that's foregone, and the difference is the cost, right? The opportunity cost. So sunk costs are costs that uh, once they occur, they cannot be recaptured in any way, shape, or form. You know, you have a stock, the stock loses value, it continues to lose value, you remain stubborn, and instead of selling the cost, you say, well, wait a minute, I." I put a lot of money into this stock when I bought it. I'm just going to hold it until it goes up again in value and I can recoup. Well, uh, economists consider that to be a mistake uh, because you should not use the cost that you've experienced in the past or incurred in the past to make decisions about the future. So that's what we mean by sunk costs. You should, they, they should not factor in your decision going forward at all. All right. Uh, you also have accounting profits, economic profits, and normal profits. Uh, accounting profits, again, would be the ones that you can uh, track on financial statements. Economic profits would be also like uh, implicit, or the way this has it here, it would be um, the difference between total revenue and total cost. So uh, the, thing, it, it, the difference here is that economic profit includes the implicit cost whereas accounting profit does not, right? And then normal profit is zero economic profit. Um, this is uh, something that really is germane more when we're looking at, say, the theory of perfect competition, which was already addressed in a previous uh, chapter, so I will skip that one. All right, so looking at this graphically, you have total revenue minus explicit costs, gives you accounting profits, total revenue minus the explicit cost, same as these, and the implicit cost, say opportunity cost, is your economic profit. And economists are always concerned more about economic profit than they are about, about accounting, as you can imagine. Okay, so production is how uh, is the activity of transforming resources into goods or services. You have fixed input, and you have variable inputs. And as the term suggests, fixed inputs um, uh, don't change no matter how the output, uh, how much the output, and then variable out input, they can change given a certain level of output. And we'll look at that in detail. All right. So you have fixed costs, costs that do not vary. Uh, this could be, say, say the lease uh, on a warehouse. It's going to be a fixed cost for a full year. Variable costs, they vary with output, so think of, say, labor. And then total cost would be total fixed cost plus total variable cost. That gives you your total cost. 
average fixed cost is total fixed cost divided by quantity and I give you the um, the uh, formula there average variable cost is uh, total fix, fixed cost divided uh, or total variable cost divided by quantity average total cost is total cost divided by quantity and then marginal cost which is the real important one here really more than anything else is average total cost divided by quantity and you'll see why marginal cost is so important it has to do with the analysis we just did in chapter 21 when we talked about the diamond and water paradox also as part of our analysis it's important to understand the short run from the long run the long run is usually a period of within one year and the long run is anything outside of one year okay all right so so let's keep going here um let's go immediately into our chart so we can sort of start putting this together and by the way i uh I, as i was preparing for this i noticed that the um uh, powerpoints that i uploaded i made some revisions to them i added a few things so i'm gonna i'm going to upload these um, powerpoints that you're looking at right here up to desire to learn because i think i've i've done a little better job of putting them together i i you know i had I had uh, downloaded or uploaded them directly from the textbook and I hadn't really had a chance to change them in any way so that's why they they look the way they do okay so so here we go so here is uh, we're looking at um, a production schedule and you notice that in column one you have total output um, this is total fixed cost. Notice it's fixed, so the cost for producing each item is always $100 for each individual. Total variable costs, right? Um, $90, $170, $240, $250, $300, $400, $500, $600, $700, $800, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1
Yep. The difference between 340 and 270 is 70. So 70 divided by 1 is 70 and so on. So what the, the, the numbers here are showing you is how much utility, remember that, or in this case, benefit in terms of dollars, right? Here we can measure it in terms of dollars. How much marginal benefit in terms of dollars is each successive item that you're producing giving you? You start with 90, right? Or at least I should say this is not marginal benefit, excuse me. This is the marginal cost. Look at what's happening. This is interesting. You go from 90 to 80, 80 to 70, 70 to 60. You notice that the cost per unit is getting smaller. And that's one of the reasons why people that you know start opening businesses want to get to mass production. Because as you uh, get to mass production, the cost of producing each successive unit, the cost goes down, right? Your unit cost. Well, here, your marginal costs are doing the same thing, but you notice they reach a certain point, right? And then something weird begins to happen. Notice, it goes from 60 to 70. So at your fifth item, the marginal costs start to increase. They increase, they increase, and they, and they keep going. And if you keep producing, your marginal costs are going to go through the roof, right? So that's a problem. Now let's look at marginal costs compared to marginal revenue. Because marginal revenue, right, is how much money are you making with the production of each excessive unit that you produce. So your marginal revenue here is the revenue that you get by producing um, an item. Now revenue, marginal revenue here, in this case, it would represent whatever this thing is, whatever this one is, it costs $131. So when you make the first one, you get a revenue of $131. When you make the second one, you get, again, for that second individual one, you get $131. So that doesn't change, right? But the marginal cost does change, you see. It keeps decreasing, and then it starts increasing. And so the question becomes, where do you want to stop production? Where do you want to, at which point do you want to stop? Well, according to standard economic theory, you want to stop where marginal costs equals marginal revenue, or as close as possible to that. Let me say that again. Where marginal costs, column five, equals marginal revenue, or as close as possible without having marginal costs be greater than marginal revenue. So in this case, what we're looking at is number nine that you want to stop producing at number nine because at that point your marginal cost is 130, your marginal revenue is 131. If you could do one more unit so that marginal revenue equal, uh, a marginal cost equal marginal revenue exactly, you would, but you can't. Because if you do one more, your marginal costs are gonna exceed your marginal revenue. And so if you remember from reading uh, the chapters on, on perfect competition, and the various forms of, of competitive structures, you always want to be where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, right? Okay, so so I think the, the other charts that I have here are examples of that same phenomenon. Um, the, these are the charts from the book. I like using these because these, these two charts show you close side by side marginal cost and marginal revenue. The charts from the book are showing you exactly the same thing. There really is not much difference. Um, this gives you the, uh, the, the, um, the formula, which I'm not gonna have you work on at all for the test. But you, know, you should study this again, compare this to the chart that I went through above and see if you can understand what's going on here with the marginal product <clears throat> and what's going on here with the marginal cost, right? Uh, what is the difference here in dollars? Remember, this is telling you that this is change. This number is a change in column seven divided by the change in column three, and that's how you get these numbers here. And when the ch whenever we say change, we mean what happens. For example, uh, column three. What happens when you go from zero to eighteen? There's a difference of eighteen. What happens when you go from eighteen to thirty-seven? That's a difference of nineteen right so that is what's going on there that change divided by the change um, 
So that is divided into the change in 7. So 40 minus 60 is what, 20? So let's, let me do a quick calculation on something. See if the book got it right. Just a moment. So 20. So here, right, this is 20, change in 7, 40 to 60 is 20, right? And then the change from, from 0, from, from, uh, from the first unit to the second is 18. So I have no way of writing on this. I wish I had, but if you take 20, um, Let's see if I can get a calculator. Maybe that's the way to do it. Yeah. So if you take 20 divided by this 18, there it is. There is your marginal cost. And that's how you would do it going all over that. If you're curious as to how that number gets, gets up. Uh, and again, there you go. I didn't even realize. There it is for you, you doing the math to show exactly how that gets calculated. All right. Okay. A um, couple of other things to know about this is know, again, for the test, all you're going to, I'm going to ask is to know what these various, the names of these various uh, graphs are. So know that. And uh, same thing here. Know what, what these are. And uh, that, that really is the extent, the extent that you're going to have to know this material, simply identifying what the graphs are. The last thing is to know something about long run average total costs, right? So long run are the costs that you incur uh, that are beyond one year. And, uh, you know, if you, if you notice that the costs tend to go down over time as you continue to produce, costs tend to go up. And think about it, that makes sense. In the beginning, you're a small firm, you're growing, you're producing more and more units, so the cost of each item is getting smaller. But as you get bigger, you have to right hire more managers, hire more employees, so your costs begin to turn around. This is at point A. And then your costs be tend to go up. And if you don't do something to try to um, either grow your business or somehow reduce costs, this can shut down your business pretty quickly. So what this is showing you is that if you take a situation where you're looking at three different firms in an industry, these are their average total cost curves, um, you can group them together and get what's called an industry-wide long average total cost curve. And this is how, you know, this is a good way of understanding what economies of scale are, what constant returns in this economies. Remember I said that in the very beginning, your marginal costs are, are decreasing and then they tend to go up, which is what we're seeing here. Your marginal costs tend to decrease, they level off, and then they start to go up. Well, in the beginning, you're enjoying what's called economies of scale. That means that for every unit of input that you are um, putting into your business, uh, you're getting a lot more benefits in terms of the, the, uh, the revenue that you're generating, right? So you're, you're enjoying economies of scale. Uh, every firm and every industry reaches a point where you have constant returns of scale. So, you know, this is a point where now costs begin to overtake your revenue. And if you continue along these lines, you started to experience this economies of scale where now your costs are going up, not going down like over here. And if you keep going like this, uh, each individual firm will fail and then the whole industry could disappear and go away, you know, resulting in a lot of unemployment um, in, the, in an industry, okay? So that really is all I have to say about these two chapters. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me, and uh, we will uh, see you next time. Bye.